Welcome back, everyone. We hope you had some coffee. Um, so we meet again for our last presentation of the day uh, by artist Naiza Khan. The title of the presentation is The Ocean as Archive. I would like to invite Professor Salah Hassan, the director of the Africa Institute, to say a few words about the presentation. Thank you. It's really with extreme pleasure that I introduce uh, Naiza Khan. Although in the world of art and the contemporary and modern, she doesn't need any introduction. Uh, and I say this seriously because she is, if the, if the history of art of the 21st century uh, is written properly, she will be, and she is actually, among the most important contemporary artists uh, that are now operating in the field. But we know that sometimes the Eurocentric hold in the, uh, in the art history as a field, but uh, so it doesn't matter. The truth is that she is a great artist. Uh, Naiza is from Pakistan, who is currently living in, um, in London. Uh, she has lived in, in Karachi for a long time. She is originally from Lahore, from what I understand, but she lived in Karachi for a long time. But, and most important that in Karachi, uh, uh, that she is one of the artists who are actually engaged in, in, in not in just making art, but in teaching art, but is also engaged in the public arena as a public intellectual. She established a very important organization that is still active in Pakistan that's called WASL, which was part of the a larger network of artists that established in the 1990s um, by Robert Loda, who wrote in Triangle meant Asia, Africa, and Europe, and the United States. So it, it was an important network that really changed the field of contemporary art. Uh, Naiza is a graduate of uh, the uh, Ruskin School uh, uh, in Oxford University. Uh, she has uh, an MFA uh, and a BFA. She also studied at Golden Smith recently in the program for architecture, which is also another area that she's also covering in a very creative way. Um, her work moves between different materials, between painting, drawing, uh, watercolors, uh, ca large canvases, but also in, in, in a conceptual way, she's also involved in performances. Uh, so you, you will see the range of her engagement that is uh, in terms of materiality, uh, in terms of concept and, and, and so forth. Uh, also, most important, she's among the few artists who also engage with craftsmanship. With, uh, she's, her work is actually co-produced uh, many times with her engagement with uh, craftsmen in uh, Karachi and Lahore. So you will see that kind of an, a creative engagement with, the, uh, with, with that kind of a skill that she also value, but also as almost like a partner with, with those uh, people. So she brings them into the fold. And uh, last, I just want to say that she has accomplished not many. I would just mention, beside her work in changing the field as a teacher in the Indus Valley School, uh, she has held so many exhibitions, uh, you know, either as, as group or uh, individual exhibitions. But most recently, she represented Pakistan. She was the first uh, artist to represent Pakistan in the Venice uh, Biennial. Uh, she's also going to be a, a, you know, participating in the uh, Sharjah Art uh, Biennial 15. So that is just for some of you to, to look forward to look at her work. Uh, so uh, without any further ado that I want to actually ask you to join me in giving a round of applause to uh, Naiza Khan. So Naiza, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Salah. That's such a generous introduction. Um, August 2013, Menorah Island. A monsoon afternoon and the sea is full. It is a circular space that I glimpse through the telescope, a sense of intimacy I did not expect a warship from the naval fleet, bodies in the ocean in abandonment and freedom. 
The sense of intimacy and freedom in the public space is shrinking, as is the sea itself. Reaching through the lens of the telescope, I'm pulling the ocean inwards, pulling these images into view as both near and far sights converge within this space. It's such a pleasure to be here and, you know, the full day of um, presentations this morning have been really, really inspiring to me. Um, I'd like very much to thank um, the Africa Institute and Sharjah Art Foundation and all the people involved in this um, conference um, to thank them for this uh, amazing event. I'd like to share three projects with you today. Um, and each of them touch on different moments of my practice. But before I move on to that, I'd like to tell you a bit about the image of the Marconi loop um, and the telescopic vision that the image creates for me in my work. And this image carried by the conference, for which I'm truly honored, is, is something quite complex. So the story begins on Menorah Island, which lies in a small archipelago of islands just off the harbor of Karachi. And my long-term engagement with this space, with the material culture of the city of Karachi, which is on the sea and the island of Menorah, have really been pivotal in this current research and all the work that I've been doing over the last 10 years. This image has an interesting genealogy as it surfaced during one of my visits to the Menorah Weather Observatory in 2010. In the ruins of the 19th century observatory, a colonial structure built in the late, around 1894, I found many old manuscripts scattered on the floor. There were ha handwritten ledgers, detailed weather reports, tide tables that charted the movement of the Indian Ocean, and nautical almanacs from British India and post-partition. It's interesting and ironic that out of the ruins and rubbish and debris of this building, I found material that has led to a number of projects and has been really formative um, in what I've done. And it's also strange because as I looked at the presentations this morning, I, I was listening to everybody's um, amazing research and the archives and libraries and museums that you know, they had researched. And I thought about you know, where had I found the material and it was in the ruins of this observatory under piles of pigeon shit actually. So <clears throat> it sort of points to the lack of archives and museums that, we, that do not exist in our region and how we kind of scavenge from the you know, debris of, of, of buildings and spaces um, and um, you know, landfills that, that we find around us. So um, I think also about how um, a ruin can cast us into the past, but also into the future as we think about um, and in how we imagine the future. So this, um, so this is actually a still from a, a film. Um, and I won't really talk about this too much because um, there are other um, images to talk about and maybe we could come back to this later. So um, the Marconi curve um, first um, was spotted uh, in this form on the left in an ad for Marconi communication equipment in, in the 1966 Nautical Almanac, which I found in the observatory. And it was very interesting because on one side, on the left, you have uh, a small, uh, you have a big uh, sort of bubble with a warship, um, maybe the British Navy. And on the right side, you have a little aeroplane, actually, if you can see it in the, in the right side of the, the bubble. So you have these kind of two opposing kind of advancements, or maybe one moving into a sort of something which is going to be obsolete, the, 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 the vessels, the ships, the warships, and one which was the air power that was taking, um, taking uh, strength. So it was really this um, fluid, asymmetric uh, petals that enclosed uh, these two ideas, and also the punchline which reads, keeping in touch. 
And this was part of a series of images uh, in the Nautical Almanac, and I'm not added all of them, but you know, for me, these images were remarkable examples of um, mid-1960s design aesthetic. But at the same time, they also veiled the anxiety of Cold War surveillance and spoke, um, and spoke about a time before globalization. Um, and also, I think for, for me, this image was not so much about vision, but about communication. Um, earlier today, I was talking to Colin, who is looking uh, and researching telescopes. So, you know, the company that uh, specialized in long distance communication and mass media broadcasting, the Marconi, Italian Marconi company, um, and, and created this ad. Um, also, you know, it recalls for me the material history of another type of um, device, which was the Fen Fresnel lens used in lighthouses. And um, there's a very interesting story um, where the lighthouse in Menora Island um, was received a high radial lens that was coming from a British company, Chance Brothers and Co. And um, this lens was actually going to Kochi, to the lighthouse in Kochi. But the engineers stopped the British vessel and said, you know, we need this on our lighthouse and we will not let it go further to India. So it's, it's interesting how these stories have evolved. Um, so uh, the, yeah, this, this drawing which um, is in the middle in my sketchbook was really um, a way for me to storyboard this idea of um, how this, uh, this, this form, what this form meant to me. It was a way to unpack and dismantle the structures of this uh, very fluid uh, shape. And, um, you know, I think uh, for me, drawing has always been a device uh, to observe and also to interrogate, uh, like, the things that I'm working on. And, um, you know, this was a very intuitive drawing. It wasn't something I'd really planned. I just sort of started thinking about this, these two forms uh, moving. Um, and uh, as they move, uh, they obscure certain things and they bring certain things into perspective. And, um, and, and as in a physical sense, I think, uh, it allowed me to supplement that theoretical twisting of space and time with a physical one, so I could actually use drawing in a way to, to, to cement that relationship um, between the optical device and what I was thinking about and also that push and pull of targets um, in, in a distance. And in a sense, on a larger scale, it made me think of mapping relations between the local and the global. On the right, there's an um, image of uh, a Durbin, a telescope, which uh, we find on Manora Beach. And people come and visit, and they pay 20 rupees to see through the telescope out into the ocean. So. Um, you know, there are bits of my um, field notes that I was reading in the beginning. Um, and, you know, most of the field notes were written in Menorah or in different cities. But somehow, the island has always been such a generative space that the ideas circle back to, to this point of the telescope, the island, and the ocean. And so I hope you'll keep that um, in mind as... Um, as I talk about the, the three projects. Um, so really to retrieve this genealogy um, from the almanacs and also from imperial technologies of surveillance because really all those 1960s almanacs that came across were ways of keeping an eye on South Asia, Southeast Asia and you know, post Second World War um, and after the independence of um, India and Pakistan uh, from colonial rule. Um, and these are small drawings. Um, I, I guess I wanted to share these. I mean, there's lots of heroic big works, big paintings, but I, I wanted to share these small sketches because, again, it's, it's through those sketchbooks and kind of small ideas that the big ideas grow. And um, these drawings... Um, 
you know, again, talk about uh, multiple points, multiple nodes, uh, points and gestures towards a kind of sprawling action in, into a three-dimensional space. And I've used the stand of the telescope as a way to indicate that I'm actually using um, that vision, that idea of looking um, outwards towards, towards other things. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, in, in some ways, um, the questions that I try to think about are how do we reimagine this, the impact of, of the uneven geography in the global south, and also about how, um, you know, being based out of an island, this work being based out of an island, um, I think a lot about Edouard Glissant's idea on archipelagic thinking and about uh, what he says of the mutability of time and space. So there is this sort of concreteness of land um, which um, you, know, you kind of leave behind. Um, so the first project, the titles of these projects have actually <clears throat> come out of you know, my own uh, notes. I think we, we all write when we are thinking aloud. And The Journey We Never na Made is a strange title, but it felt really right. In the end, this project, which was meant to go to the Kochi Biennial in 2016, it went, but I never got my visa to go to the Kochi Biennial. So it was an interesting uh, kind of title to have. Um, so my long-term engagement with this small island uh, sometimes resembles uh, tourism. So I've taken hundreds of photographs and collected inexpensive souvenirs, mostly small handmade boats covered in shells and sold in souvenir shops by the sea. Um, during this time of working on this island, I developed modes of research um, and ideas of field work um, as many of you do. Um, and this uh, meant something quite different to me in my practice as a visual artist. Um, I realized through walking across the island uh, that um, you know, menorah was something of an extension of Karachi's spatial politics. It had a very multi-religious uh, history. <clears throat> Religious sites marked the island, the Gurdwara, the Hindu Mandir, um, Sufi shrines, uh, St. Paul's Church. So there were a lot of images that I, and places that I had to encounter and think about. Um, but really, it was also that menorah evoked the metaphor of a body that had been gutted and cast away. It was almost left, um, you know, um, in neglect. And <clears throat> this process of collecting objects and photographs um, had been a kind of long-term archival approach to the island. Um, the image at the bottom left is uh, one of the stalls of the souvenir boats uh, that would often be sold, and I would pick up uh, a boat every time I went. And each time I found in my studio more and more boats um, and I realized that they're all quite different. And, you know, at one point, the boats became double-story boats, and I thought, this is really strange. So, you know, it, it, was, it was, for me, a way to observe the changing aesthetics of these craft vessels uh, through the language and history of their construction. Um, I um, will show you what I did with these images. So. Um, the project consists of a series of model vessels which were made by local artisans. And in place of the boats that they typically made for the souvenir trade, the sources of these new vessels included um, <clears throat> cargo vessels, small fishing trawlers, as well as historic vessels that marked the Indian Ocean. So these were archives of photographs I'd taken in Karachi Harbor for the last 15 years. And some of these um, became, uh, well, the images, the photographs were researched in terms of, you know, the tonnage of the cargo vessel. So Hellenic Horizon was probably, uh, you know, a 20 ton cargo vessel. So what I did was, was I um, carefully scaled down the, the line drawings and, fabric and took these drawings to uh, 
the model and souvenir makers that lived in Manora and Karachi. And each craftsman had taken the individual line drawing and then they reinterpreted its form and aesthetic. Um, so, so actually the image on the top right, um, this was made by um, um, an artisan who actually, um, he was, um, he fixed mu musical instruments. So he worked with, with musical instruments and then he also made these boats, which was interesting. Um, so just that reinterpretation was really interesting. And also out of that reinterpretation came out, you know, this idea of how the unscripted outcomes that, that develop in, in, an, in, a, in this kind of movement from the hand, you know, the loss of identification and the re-scripting of a narrative. So the artisans were making these vessels. They were moved between different hands, different people that worked on them. And, um, you know, in some way, uh, these were vessels that uh, had quite a historical impact on the region. Uh, HMS Wellesley was the, was, was, was the British, uh, you know, vessel that came and fired the first cannon on Menorah Fort in um, 1838. And, uh, you know, it was kind of preceded the annexation of Sindh. So, you know, these were boats that existed and then were reconstructed through the hands of these artisans, which, you know, later on I found that idea very interesting, that they were in control of something uh, that was being made um, and it was being adapted and translated by, by them. Um, so, you know, I, I felt like um, I was drawing on an existing tradition of urban craft production, uh, which was found along the Karachi Harbor. Uh, a lot of these boats were made for other markets. So, you know, as I spoke to people, I realized that, you know, a certain vessel was made um, as 2,000 pieces and sold in Bandar Abbas in Iran, and it would go there to be sold because, because people liked it. And, then there was also this idea of the anonymous language and rhythm of how they were fabricated. Um, and this was kind of interesting because the original boats were very low budget souvenirs and they kind of absorbed these influences of everyday life, religious script, Bollywood culture, um, you know, all kinds of references and also the shifting aspirations of the consumer. So, um, you know, as I said, um, it was interesting because um, the little boat on the bottom right um, was one of the earliest boats I, I bought. And later on, they became quite different. So I asked, um, I asked the workshop, uh, you know, what has changed about these boats? And he said to me that actually, first women used to make these boats, uh, you know, which is why they were so delicate and the, 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 the small seed uh, shells were so small and crafted in a different way. And now because the women are out and earning more in the factories, um, you know, we have to give it to other people to make them. So it's just, you know, these sorts of stories were um, important to me in terms of how uh, I was thinking about, um, you know, the consumer and the producer. Um, this is um, my own kind of visualization of how these boats should have been installed in Kochi in vitrines um, marked with their original titles of what the boat was when it was made and its own specific history. Um, and then, um, you know, this is, this is an image of some of the boats together. So, so I was really interested in how an object invested with multiple layers of production can offer very different kinds of narratives um, about our relationship to history and also the economies of production. Um, and, you know, how these narratives can be scripted into objects um, as they travel and move between different ports and cities. Um, these are some of the spaces that I worked in, some of the people I worked with, and the workshops. Um, So actually working with different artisans and workshops meant that, you know, much of the, uh, that much of my intervention 
uh, to use these images um, was translated and it was lost and it was retold uh, through, through that adaptive nature of the craftsmen and their process. Uh, not just through the size of the vessels, but also just the way they, 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 they worked the, the, the shells and the lights and the different properties of the object. Um, out of these boats um, and fabrication came a number of drawings. Um, and these drawings were, for me, a direct response to that process of fabrication, the hybridization of, of the vessel, and, um, you know, a kind of deep dive into <clears throat> my own thinking of how <clears throat> I think about the sedimented nature of these objects and kind of imagining them surfacing from the depth of the ocean. Um, and I, I guess um, one of the things that I, um, I really hold on to is the imagination as an artist to be able to um, imagine, conceptualize, and then hopefully to draw something that, um, that comes close to that, um, to that conceptualization. Um, I'm going to read a few uh, notes from the field notes, and um, I, they don't necessarily connect to the drawings, but um, perhaps they're sort of something which sits alongside uh, these images. September 2013, Amsterdam. At the Rijksmuseum, I saw objects from the 1613 shipwreck Witte Liu. How did Hokusai look at the ocean as opposed to Caspar David Friedrich? The way the seas were constructed, how did artists imagine its form and how was it treated in paint? The sea under construction. December 2016, Amsterdam. I seem to be coming back again and again to the broken cracked porcelain and the company paintings at the Rijksmuseum. There's a strange dichotomy between these untroubled images of the company paintings and the violence in the broken objects, their patterns of life and foliage disrupted by the shipwreck, unhinged objects from the depth of the ocean the object, beached, in sand, in mud, in time, in history, anchored in its own awkward politics of loss and conflict. Okay, um, and one more. Um, I'm looking at the clusters of cracked porcelain and pepper, December 14th, 2014, Amsterdam. I'm looking at the clusters of cracked porcelain and pepper found in the wreck of the Dutch East India Company trading vessel. The language of these forms creates another vocabulary of sorts. A, a kind of compression occurs. I see the shipwreck as a process, a sort of agent of time and transformation. Continuous time. Objects can join and make another kind of object memory bound. There is a story unfolding between the objects, maps, company paintings, and the captions that hold them captive. These objects tremble with mutinous thoughts. Reparations, it is whispered, like the monsoon that swells from the depths. October 2016, New York. After watching Liquid Traces, the left-to-die boat by Pezzani and Heller, I cannot think about the ocean as I did before. A sea of impunity, the ocean bed a mass grave, Europe's amnesia. The Dutch East India ships, a cargo liner, a refugee boat, a life raft. Each vessel represents a particular power structure of imperialism and its afterlife. So there are about 12 or 15 drawings, and um, I will not read the text with all of them, but I just wanted to show you the drawings and kind of uh, think about a parallel stream of consciousness that I was writing through the field notes. Um, I guess um, it's good to show you uh, a little bit about the Marconi curve because I think it kind of is something which is a structure in a lot of the work that I'm going to share in the next project as well. 
which has hundreds of birds killed. And um, I had um, produced this for the, the project at the Venice Biennial, and then it was shown uh, at the Lahore Biennial, curated by Hur. And um, it was, uh, you know, uh, an exciting uh, project. And um, the installation that you see is, um, is from the um, Lahore Biennial. And um, it's a multi-part installation comprised of cast brass objects and maps and a recorded reading of lives and properties lost on seasonal monsoons from the year 1939. So a copy of the India Weather Review um, serves as the starting point for this work. And of course, I found that weather review in the Menorah Observatory. Um, you know, again, something that uh, was sitting there and I started looking at it and the taxonomy of weather, the archive of weather history uh, really um, produced this, 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 this project. And it was really interesting for me to think about the, the detail and obsessiveness um, of how the British um, sort of uh, archived weather, along with barometric readings and wind force, the report, revealed the link between natural and fiscal storms. Um, so hundreds of birds killed was really, um, you know, something repeated. I mean, it was really looking at ecological crisis, but its entanglement with capital as well. Um, the maps uh, developed through layers of visualization and um, uh, I will just show you a few details of, of how the maps developed. This is a closer view of the installation. The colors are a bit distorted, but um, you know. The clusters of the objects um, were small objects I found in the secondhand market in Karachi, secondhand objects. And then I cast about 300 of these objects um, and welded them together like fossilized drawings, like, um, you know, layered on top of each other. And um, really, um, the other, uh, so there were about 76 tiles that make up the maps of the different cities. And um, this process of uh, excavating the maps um, was, was quite, a, quite a, you know, it, the back end of this project was quite intensive. Um, here I'm just going to show you the weather report at the top over here and also the Menorah Observatory. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, this, this idea of predicting the monsoon was something which was very much uh, part of the British Empire's sort of desire to control land and to think about how crops are going to be planted, which crops are going to be planted, and this sort of whole risk factor was something that was entangled with, uh, with capital, as we see in, in the future as well. Um, the, um, the, the sort of task, the cartographic uh, task of, of uh, extracting these maps through um, GIS data and then uh, open street maps was a way to kind of pull out the, 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 some of the, the apology of the cities, but then also to think about how these soft files could then be um, translated into uh, engraved cast um, brass uh, objects. And this was, this was a process that I um, sort of achieved with the, my team that was based in Karachi and London and Berlin. And, um, the soft files um, were laser etched into thick acrylic sheets and then they were cast into brass. <clears throat> One of the things that I found really interesting was this organic process of the brass and also the kind of uh, uh, the, the fast technology of the digital process but the slow technology of the casting process. And there were a lot of questions um, in this around ideas of erasure scale and distance, and also just the transformation through which these maps um, kind of went through from that digital process to the final tangible hand cast brass maps. Um, and I think, um, you know, what, what this intensive process um, 
for me uh, conceptualized was really the differences um, in the techniques of production, um, the dichotomies between long established artisanal processes and how they overlap with um, rapidly evolving software and satellite mapping. Um, in the end, I worked with uh, a, a wonderful team of artisans in Golimar in North Karachi, and we worked for many weeks to produce uh, these maps. So this is an image of, of that neighborhood, um, of which I'm making a small film about them and about the process. Um, I think it would be good to move on because I have a few more, two more projects to share with you. One more, in fact. Um, <clears throat> but just wanted to sh um, share these images of um, water maps that I'm beginning to produce. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, for the Sharjah Biennial in 2015, I'm not going to really share the work, but it's interesting because this um, work made in 2011. Um, I would never thought about it as a water map or the idea of mapping water, I guess because, you know, we, we live in a city and our, we think about our lives through the context of land rather than the ocean. We, we don't really face the ocean. So when I looked at this image now, I thought, well, this was really the first ma water map that I produced um, because the water has this kind of, this, this map has this, very strong quality of, 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 of that liquid um, and it has a, it's a connection to the things that I'm doing now. Um, <clears throat> also that kind of connection to the monsoon um, and how water impacts the structures of the cities and lives that we live. Um, and again, you know, mining one's own work, um, again, there's this repetition or this sort of, uh, a sense of the, the conditions of weather and um, really thinking about maritime landscapes and um, the landscape of the monsoon um, and how it's a part of the living structure that we, we've inherited, I guess. Um, so, um, and at this time I was also creating large format oil paintings, um, which again kind of have this sense of really looking outwards towards the ocean um, and looking from land out onto sea um, and also thinking about, um, you know, not just the physical but also the, the, the social and historical aspects, the, the mythic, the, the, the idea of um, uh, stories passed down and, and poems from the Sufi saints which have been part of the island. Um, and, and, and all of this has been kind of, in a sense, uh, a way that I've learned something um, from this process. And I think I would also just um, point to the fact that um, I, I, I feel that, um, you know, as a studio artist, we, we stick very close to our studio space and um, it's a space of contemplation. But as soon as you move out of your studio, what happened was this very intense learning uh, and also um, differentials of knowledge. So uh, more of like an interdisciplinary learning. So, so I learned a lot from the artisans. I learned from urban scholars. I learned from, you know, the fishermen and uh, from the uh, people who uh, produce these boats. So there was, uh, there's a kind of whole um, knowledge production which, which I felt um, was very important and, and generative at this time. Um, I'm going to show a small um, video at the end uh, after this project, and this is the third and last um, um, project that I'd like to talk about, uh, Sticky Rice and Other Stories, which was a four-channel video installation. And it was um, really as, as a starting point, I, I've been doing a lot of mind maps, and. This uh, one on the left is a small section of a larger map in which I was thinking about infrastructures and histories um, and actually thinking about um, the way that, um, you know, the, our, our position in South Asia uh, as, a, as a port city, how Karachi's evolved, you know, through the many conflicts in the region and 
the new Silk Route map, and really thinking about all the maps that have like, imposed themselves on the land um, and continue to uh, in a very real sense. Um, and I wanted to, um, you know, again, bring back this image of the Marconi loop and this sketch because um, it's something that uh, has continued in the way that uh, the videos have evolved. So Sticky Rice and Other Stories um, is in two parts. It traces a mental map of the region around Karachi from colonial textile trade to containerization cargo shipping. And really it's the disorientating effect of this geography which is mirrored uh, in the way that uh, on, on Karachi's own locality, which is obscured by the movement of goods from one place to another and with less and less friction through this cargo trade. Um, I suppose uh, this, the new Silk Route and its infrastructure in Pakistan maps a new grid um, and creates a different movement uh, across different ecologies and geographic terrains. The first part of Sticky Rice um, follows my journey through the communities where I worked on building these boats. And then <clears throat> it moves on to uh, these boats which are pushed along the seafront in a cart um, where actual cargo ships operate. So there's this interesting uh, juxtaposition of these boats made by the artisans and then the way that they are seen across this landscape. Um, so in a sense, um, through that craft process, I'm, trying, I'm tying the artisans back to the global trade routes in some way. Um, and um, the second part of Sticky Rice um, is about an artisan who's making a telescope and cleaning it. And he tells us a bit about the telescope, how it's made with vintage binoculars and is constructed from parts smuggled across the border from Iran to the Chaman border. And these are trade routes which began in the time of the Soviet Afghan war from 1979 to 89. And in a sense, they also, you know, talk about informal economies, uh, the second-hand markets and the smuggling routes that exist even to today. So the telescope becomes, um, in a sense, a relic of the past, but also a technology of vision. Um, I think it would be nice to put on the film, and I could just show you a few minutes of that, because I'm aware that um, we are running short of time. Yeah. Um, I just want to briefly uh, mention that um, for the Sharjah Biennial, I'm working on a film and performance called Set in a Moment Yet Still Moving. And it, I hope that you'll all join that um, in February. So until then, I'll just um, put on the film. Yeah. Thanks, Vijay. Fantastic. सिस्टम था कि तो ज़्यादा जिन्हें इसको देखते थे लोगों के लिए एक नई चीज़ थी मतलब जैसे एक नई चीज़ मार्केट में आती इस तरह एक नई चीज़ थी जो आगे देखते थे चल और मतलब लोग इतना जो जान होता था कि लोग पहले पैसे पकड़ाते थे इतना मतलब वो साफ़ था लेकिन जो जो वक्त गुजरता गया ना उस साफ ये नाइन्टी की बात बता रहा हूँ उस वक्त को बहुत मैं खुद जो इतना बता रहा हूँ आपको मेरे को उर्दू नहीं आती थी गाँव में मिडल पढ़ा है और मिडल के पास जो घर से बात के बस वो मानी समझे वहाँ बात है समझे ये नई टेक्नोलॉजी जी 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 ये जो दूरबीन का आप जो बता रहे थे कहाँ से आती है दूरबीन ये दूरबीन जो है ये वैसे तो जर्मनी बनाती है रशिया बनाती थी पहले किसी दौर में चाइना हो गया 
लेकिन जो सबसे अच्छी है ना वो रशियन है क्योंकि उसमें पायदारी है उसकी ऐसी पायदारी है कि उसमें अभी तो मेरे पास ऐसा एक गाना है नहीं जो बिल्कुल जीरो मीटर हो ना नया उसमें आप देखेंगे तो आप बिल्कुल परेशान हो जाएंगे कि वाकई कुछ चीज़ है क्योंकि एक अच्छी चीज़ उन्होंने बनाई उस वजह इसकी कीमत थी तकरीबन तेरह सौ चौदह सौ में एक दाना आराम से नहीं मिलता था कोयटा से या कराची में कोयटा से कोयटा कैसे कोयटा क्योंकि ये चमन के बार्डर से ना ये आती हैं स्मगलिंग होकर ना वहाँ से लाडें आती हैं कैमरा दूरबीन डिजिटल कैमरे ये सारी ना लाडें होती हैं वहाँ पर ना बाहर से माल आता है कंटेनर में वहाँ उतरता है वहाँ पर ना बोली होती है हाँ एक्शन होता है उसके बाद फिर वो सारी लाट उठाते हैं ना उसमें उनका नसीब है कि अच्छी चीज़ निकलती है फिर वो लेके आते हैं कोयटा शहर में कोयटा कहाँ से आते हैं चमन से आते हैं चमन से ईरान से आते हैं ईरान से रशिया ईरान से जी 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 रशिया की है ना मतलब आप वहाँ से ऐसे करके इस एक रास्ता ना स्मरगिंग का हमारे मुल्क में तो ये चमन बार्डर है ना ये बहुत मशहूर है और यहाँ आप चले जाएँ आपको हर एक चीज़ ये जो गाड़ियाँ यहाँ कराची में चलती हैं ये इसका तो वहाँ से जो ना लेके यहाँ लेकर आते हैं और उनको जंग थी अफगानिस्तान में जब रूस भी जी 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 मतलब नाइन एलेवन से पहले जो जंग थी सब जी 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 तो उस उस टाइम का आपका ख्याल है ये सारे बॉर्डर ये स्मगलिंग का रास्ता हाँ बिल्कुल बिल्कुल उसी तरह ही उस टाइम फिर लेकिन यहाँ पर अभी भी इस टाइम भी ना चैन आप चले जाए चमन बार्डर पर आपको मैं कह रहा हूँ कि हर एक चीज़ आपको और ये ऑडियो वीडियो कैमरे और डिजिटल और कहाँ से आती हैं आप भी वहीं से ही आती हैं अच्छा हमने जो देखे हैं ना वो इस तरह के एक बंदा था हमारा कोटा में उसके साथ थोड़ी सलामदा होगी तो मैंने कहा यार सर फिर हम वहाँ कोटा गए तो मैंने जो दूरबीन लेनी थी तो वो मुझे चमन पर ले गया तो ये तकरीबन कोटा से इसका आगे जो है चार घंटे का सफ़र है चमन का तो चमन बार्डर के ऊपर दुनिया की चीज़ें जो है बाहर की ममालिक आती वहाँ उतरती हैं वहाँ फिर ये बड़े बड़े किरदार उठा के टेलीस्कोप असला जी 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 सब, सब कुछ आए ये सारी चीज़ें वहाँ लेते आते हैं वहाँ से फिर कोटा कोटा शहर में जब आती है फिर मार्केट में आती है मार्केट वाले पूरी पूरी लाड जो है लेते हैं फिर वो देखते हैं कि दाना में कितने में पड़ा फिर आगे जो है वो दिस इज थैंक यू वेरी मच And it shows. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much for for a rich and a complex uh, presentation that shows the the complexity and diversity and materiality of your work. So, you. I'll see if the audience had any questions uh, or any reactions. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. That was very beautiful. I really enjoyed it. And I've, I've, I've lived in Karachi for a summer, in Sadar Bazaar, and I've been to Gulumar, and all of these places, and I can see the local faces, and I'm really grateful for the project. Um, I'm curious whether these artisanals have uh, a background in Dao building, ship building traditionally in this region was quite common, all the way to Kutch and Gujarat, and they were also employed in the Gulf and Oman and Kuwait. So I'm, I'm wondering if they had such a background. Thank you. Um, I don't think the artisans have, but there are a lot of villages along the coastline which, in which they are shipbuilding villages. So I've been to those and, you know, um, it's very interesting because the boats they build are baloch. Basically, there are three, four different types of boats that are built. And actually, they get Burmese teak and, you know, it's a very long project. It takes about a year to build one of the large boats and often they're sold to Sheikh and Oman and, you know, that's an interesting connection. So. Yeah, but I think the artisans are not so involved in that, but there's another shipbuilding industry in that, in the, that coastline, yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, part of your work here uh, revolves around the principle of decay, of loss, brutal death. So since this is a reinterpretation why that logic? Why not the logic of have your feelings? So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that logic. 
because you're talking about hundreds of birds dead, mm. shipwreck, mm. Left, left to die. So I'm wondering why that optical? Yeah. You know, the title, Hundreds of Birds Killed, came out of the uh, weather report. So it, it was a line that is uh, in that uh, you know, archive. And I found that line really evocative, um, also because it points to the ecological disaster of climate crisis that we face. Um, and I, I guess to ask, answer the broader question, um, I think out of ruin, there is a kind of um, generative force within ruins. So also just uh, you know, looking and talking, uh, putting this talk together, I thought you know, it all comes out of the observatory, which was a ruined building. Um, I think also, be, I think that these spaces are generative. Um, I think that um, you, know, you kind of are able to ask certain questions when a space is uh, in decay or in ruin. And I don't really see it as a negative force. I see it very much as an agent of kind of something positive happening. Um, I think when a building is, um, you know, not in a ruin, it's harder to access it. It's meaning what it meant in history, what it can mean to us in the future, how we, how we uh, regenerate it to become something else. So actually the Menorah Observatory, um, I went um, with many people on, like I would take people on walking tours and um, once uh, two architects came with me and you know we started imagining that this observatory building can be a small garden or it can be a space to house a library. So things like that um, you know, actually happened. So I, I don't, um, I find it's, as an artist definitely we are attracted, I think I'm making a generalization, but um, I think it's a way to enter that space when it's not um, in its heroic form, but actually in a, in a more vulnerable kind of way exists. Um, I want to. I want to thank the um, organizers for putting um, this presentation, your presentation, um, with today's program. Because to me, it, it, it takes me back to um, Professor Popper's um, ships this morning. Um, and by, uh, w with, with the visualization, with the artwork, um, your artwork invites us to put ourselves into the space. To, um, to explore our own reactions. Now obviously we are not, um, we are not putting ourselves totally into the space of those um, slaving ships that were um, uh, interrupted and, and people um, then brought to land and made into indentured labor or another type of slavery. Um, I mean, obviously we're um, remembering the difference, but yet the art with the, with the, his, with the historical record um, in, invites us to, I think, to ask what might this history mean to me? And with that, me also the question of then what are the implications going forward? to something that will become history later. So, thank you. Thank you very much. May I add that in, in a project that you've done uh, based on, on Trinidad, uh, mm -hmm. you've done with the, the issue of slavery, but it's also indentured labor. I don't know if... Yeah, I didn't show the project between two oceans, but it's something that started in 2017 and I'm, it's continuing. Uh, it will be shown in the Guangzhou Biennial in next year. But that is looking at uh, histories of uh, indenture from South Asia. And um, it's, I'm looking, I mean, again, I think the problematic for, for me is how do you use the archives of that history? You know, how do you use it in a material sense? How do you handle it? How do you, because it's, it's, it's difficult, I can't really, work with bodies somehow. I can work with silos and buildings and containers, but I couldn't, you know, I have done it and I feel uncomfortable about the way that, you know, I'm using that, um, that archive, which is, you know, has to be respected. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Naiza. This was such a brilliant, uh, both the presentation and your reflections uh, on them. Uh, uh, 
the, um, the in, in, I'm working on, on film, and in terms of the other sort of uh, Gulf Islands, you know, th there is a similar life pattern, but also aesthetic sensibility that I happen uh, to, to find. I think my question is whether, you know, you plan to expand your work outside uh, in Archipel uh, archipelagic con uh, connections with other islands in the Gulf that, uh, or you know, the larger Arabian Sea, uh, as such, that could be interesting. And uh, not, mm, I hope uh, tomorrow to talk about a film that emerges pretty much from that coast. Uh, from is called from Gulf to Gulf That's to right. Gulf. You. I'm sure you know it, so that will give us a, the view from the boat, so to yes, speak, but yeah. maybe tomorrow I'll, uh, I'll talk about it. No, that's a fantastic project. I saw it at the Sharjah Art Foundation, the whole um, retrospective by camp, um, and it's very inspiring, of course, um, especially because it's the people on the boats that are speaking and making you know, the film as they are moving. But uh, yeah, I think the opportunity to engage with the other islands and this relationship of the Indian Ocean Rim is, 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 is very put, you know, potentially fantastic to, for me to engage in. And you know, I look forward to the opportunity to expand the work. Really fantastic and very, very beautiful. Um, and I, I, I got a nice preview of it this morning, but it didn't give a sense of the, just the complexity of it. I have a kind of a stupid question. Um, having gone and looked for and looked at and tried to find and not found archives of observatories in Hyderabad and Kolkata, is there something particular about the sort of ephemeral knowledge produced by a weather observatory that means that it's always going to be its own ruin, right? And that it won't, mm. be, pr that it won't be preserved. I mean, is there something about those archives in particular that means that they don't become sort of transferred into somewhere that, where they are preserved? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, because we think about knowledge production, you know, seeking to better something or, you know, to advance some, somebody's lives or some country's future. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think that's a great connection to think about, uh, the sense of um, what is found through those observatories, you know, whether it's about the stars or the tides or the, you know, the, the, the impending menace of, you know, our Anthropocene, like, lives now. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's something that, uh, that we can tap into. I think it's a very kind of soul-connecting project for human beings to tap into because we seem to separate science from, like, the sense of um, the... Um, the occult, or we separate it from the spiritual, and I think yeah, th that sense of, you know, knowing something or thinking about the beyond, which that technology offers us, is 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 a, is a strong kind of like thought process to to access. Um, but ov obviously, for so many people, it's obsolete, right? Because you don't want to fund something which is not gonna really save your life or, you know, help in the capitalist machine. So, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> the telescopes in the Menorah Weather Observatory were stolen many years ago, and they're, they're no longer there, but you see the empty spaces where they would raise the telescopes to the stars. Yeah. Thank you. Um, sort of picking up on the previous question, I wanted to ask you about archive and your understanding of that sort of term or idea, because as a sort of historian, we often think about archives as these 
acts of state power of organizing knowledge of preserving some knowledge and not and so that so I, I, you know you you didn't I feel like th it's very evocative this notion mm -hmm. of um, the, the ruined building as an archive, but in some ways I think of it as a kind of anti-archive. And the ocean mm. almost like iconically is something that like disappears things and then occasionally throws things up at you. So I, I wanted to know more about how you were thinking about the idea of the, the archive mm. and what work it's doing for you. Well, there are two things. I think the first is that um, in a place like Pakistan, there's a real dearth of archives, museums, you know, scholarly material. Um, and so we think about the street as an archive. So the notion of the archive or the museum is, is very, very, you know, it's very different to what we imagine it in the West. Um, and how do you construct it? I mean, I, I know this, the, I, I often, because of the long duration of this project um, and because of the nature of it, I've collected so much material over, the, over this time, which doesn't, it's very unruly, it doesn't fit into anything, um, into my practice or into anybody's notion of what an artist should be doing. Um, so I, I spoke about it as a, a kind of living archive, something which keeps moving and is mobilized through those encounters. Uh, with people and sites and revisiting sites also. Um, so I guess, um, you know, there's been so much written about archives in the last decade um, and, I, and I try to sort of think about where this belongs in that process. I'm not really sure yet. Um, in terms of the ocean, yeah, I mean, I wanted to think about all the stories that are stolen from the ocean. You know, if you think about that, um, uh, you think about, um, you know, the Mare Liberum, that idea that the ocean is free, but actually, you know, it's, everything has been stolen from it, all of its stories. Um, so um, I think for us, the ocean is there also to find that, you know, how do we excavate things and how do we use the imagination? That's how I try to work through my process, apart from other things as well. You know, to imagine the links between points and ideas and archives and lived kind of experience. Oh, well, to end this, I couldn't help but ask you a foolish question, which is one of your, th oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. It's not really a question, it's just adding uh, up to his comment about the archive. What, what was interesting in this work, Najra, and thank you for uh, a very uh, beautiful presentation and your work here at the, at the South Asia Pop too is really great. And anyway, what I want to do is say about the archive and ruins, you know, but uh, so a lot of artists, I mean, most people whose histories are not written go back to ruins, to what Naminata was saying, why go to ruins, you know, <laughs> why not hope go, going back to ruins to understand what's happening in, in, a, in a history that they, that's not written, that's not written in the archive. Uh, yeah. So I want to look at ruins that way. And ruins too are memories, right? Yeah. So like Tasho Mahal, Habta Gabriel, um, I don't know if it's filmic, who, who passed away about, a, a, a professor at UCLA, who passed away about five or six years ago, he goes into these, uh, he, he calls it these ephemeral things that we do not write about anyway. It's, it's in the memory, it's in the ruins of memory that we go back and dig it from those ruins, right? So those ruins are uh, some kind, you know, uh, there's some kind of an archive too. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. archive is not really something that's um, historically known as a found object in some library sitting somewhere that can be d d dug and taken out. But archives can be, you know, we have to reconstruct archives from anything that, yeah. that re <laughs> remains through memory, through found objects, through whatever, yeah. history yeah. of women. That's how we reconstruct history of women that have never been written in the writing of history. I sure. just wanted to comment on, Thank on, you so on, much. on yeah. the idea of archive. Sure. Ruin, ruins are disruptive, you know? They shuffle things around. My, my question may not be anyway. After all this great intellectual work, it's just, I'm curious of you, you named it, 
sticky rice while all Pakistani Indian eat basmati rice. So just tell me. Yeah, it's, it's in, you, you know it's interesting. I was um, I was uh, doing some research in my MA at the Center for Research Architecture, and um, it was about the New Silk Route and the infrastructures and how land is being you know restructured to grow certain crops. And in one um, piece, I read about how uh, sticky rice is being cultivated in Punjab. In, lo in you know, Punjab is the very, it's like the very fertile soil. And I just thought, you know, we don't eat sticky rice, we eat basmati rice. And, you know, why would they be? And obviously it was because they were growing it to take it back to China. So it just became sticky rice and other stories. So there will be a part three. Wait for it. <laughs>